I can see you too. It looks like you're getting a bit stressed, stressed there for a while. Oh, it's bears. Fuck. Oh, mate, I'm fucked. I don't do well under pressure, especially with technology. Mate, I'm a fucking spud when it comes to tech. <laughs> You know, the beauty of it is, though, I got it. See, I got a producer, Jason, sits here, and I just sit here and look pretty, and he just decides he just gets all the shits order for me, and it makes me look smart. Oh, mate, if that's a um, I know, I know this well that a show is made or fucking broken on its producer. Yeah, yeah. And you must have a good one there, yeah. Mate, we've got the, we've got the best producer in uh, the radio landscape. Oh, nice. Which just makes it fucking handy. Pump that. <laughs> How are lads? How are? There you go. Good mate, good. We're hanging in here. We're in the warm now. Except it's cooling down over here. Are we good to go? Yeah, yeah we're on. We're on, we're on here. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, good shit. Hey, apologies about last time. I'm just a spud, basically. There's no <laughs> two ways around it. We're sitting here, I'm, we're I'm sitting here just chatting. I'm to breathe unaided. <laughs> we're sitting here chatting and I was like, I wonder if he, I bet you I fucking said New Zealand time or Australian time. I bet you thought maybe you're waiting no. there at 9.30. No, just in a spud. Just straight spud. Yeah, just what'd you hit home? No, it was I was out doing out working and then came in and was like, oh, I've timed this perfectly and was just yeah. sitting here in the booth, just done some VOs and then <laughs> you know, I had a look at my phone and I was messaging you going, We're still on, you're like, Hey, you're miles away. <laughs> yeah. Where are you? <laughs> Mate, we've had you a chat by we, a we, whole hour. We had a chat and a coffee and we were into it. Yeah, no, nah, I'm a battler. Apologies Thank, about that. Thanks for coming on, mate. I appreciate it. We were trying to, we always try and hook these up. You actually, no, you, this is our virgin um, podcast online for me, for Smoko. First one. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you should feel pretty special about that. <laughs> mate, I might have tanked this whole thing before it even gets <laughs> off the ground. I know. Let's just, I'll just see whether I release this or not, whether I congratulate you. Yeah, yeah. Nah, this like is the first one. Stuff in the cut. We always try and do, we always try and do them in, like, obviously in the studio just this obviously the one-on-one -on -one, as you know looks far better but i made this pretty good here we've got a big i got you on a big screen tv 40 oh, yuck. 50 inch yeah i know see everything every nose here oh shit, oh, shit this there's a few of those yeah shut this is my little uh, this is my little panic room yeah is this uh, where you do the vo's is it happens yeah so i'm uh well, I, to, I managed to steal this because nobody could be bothered taking it down and uh it's called a whisper room they're about seven grand us and um an agency here that that i do a bunch of voiceover with was like we're moving business uh moving buildings and uh we no longer need this booth do you want to buy it and i was like oh, i don't have that much money to be thrown at a voiceover booth and they'll like, make us an offer and i was like a thousand bucks and they're like uh, how about go fuck yourself and i was like well that's that's understandable <laughs> but yeah. um i know as well as you do there's not a huge market for secondhand voiceover booths in new zealand so let me know yep. when you want me to pick it up and then it was literally the last thing left in the building everything else moved out and then i swooped in with me tools and, and, and knocked it a bit <laughs> and and now she's in my garage oh is this your garage oh nice yeah even better yeah, yeah, it's nice perfect you work from yeah. home so, yeah uh, and that was good through through a lockdown it was um perfect yeah no doubt so i understand congratulations in order i follow the uh the airwaves closely and turns out you're an award winner yes yes we finally got one uh for me it's been uh it's been a long time coming I have, i've never really and this sounds kind of terrible but i've never been that focused on radio and now right. having moved into this new role that i'm in it's it's definitely it's definitely got me pretty invigorated to actually make some make some milestones and and really achieve something with a great team that we've got and it, and it's and it's worked out we've been a number one show and now we've been awarded best drive show in new zealand so how about that? Yeah, it's exciting. So what's just off? Boys like, are pretty fizzed. I lo I listen to a radio. I don't actually listen to too much radio, if I'm honest, anymore, just because the ads do my head in. But I do listen to a little bit. But what sort of? Because you're looking like from a radio show, from your point of view, like you say, oh, I'm going to be focused on it. I'm going to really give this effort. Um, it looks like it's there's no effort to it whatsoever. You know what I mean? It looks like it's something yeah. where you just <laughs> like you stroll it. Like obviously, I'm not trying to offend you here, but you stroll in five minutes for, and t and tell me if this is actually what you do because I'll be pissed. But if you stroll in five minutes before the show and then just wing it the whole show, that's what that's what. I, but I guess there's a method to your madness too, isn't there? Because that's how it's meant to come out. Well, yeah. There, I mean, it has to sound sort of conversational. It sort of has to sound like we're just having a chat with the lads. But the truth is, well, they they contract you because I'm a contractor to the to MediaWorks, which is yeah. the owner of the radio station I work for. And uh, and much like tradies, um, I I earn outside of that. And to be qualified yeah. in that role, you need to be earning more than just in one spot. So 
we turn up, the boys and I sort of chatting. There's four of us uh, that are on a continual working document, so we're pinging stuff back and forward, uh, ideas, people that we should be catching up with for interviews, a different take on something that's in the media. If we've got to cover something that's pretty big news, like we had the budget come out the other day, how are we going to attack that? Who's listening to us and what do they want to hear out of it? Because we could tear through the the tourism sector and say it's $400 million has been allocated and mate, we've got people that listen to us that are driving tractors or trucks or on building sites and they just don't give a shit about the tourism industry necessarily. Yeah. It's like, well, how's that going to affect me? And so we focused on the on the trades based thing, which is massive out of this budget. There's a whole bunch of money being tipped into into trades and retaining apprenticeships and and making sure that anyone can pick up a trade now. Because all of a sudden it's the same it's mate, it's classic how it's flipped. So for the longest time it's been seen I'd say for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, that a trade was uh, for somebody that pissed around at school and was keen to smash a few dingers on the weekend and then uh, wear hivers for the week. And I'm not saying that it's not that, uh, but it was kind of seen as, as not as a career option. And now every yeah, single, right. we call them cashed up um, cashed up bogans. These, like, <laughs> mate, people that are in trades that are my age that are they're running – they're running Riviere launches and they've got batches and they're running, they've just got their life sorted. And yeah. the people that have traditionally been seen as important, like lawyers, accountants, whatever, yeah. that kind of gone by the way. So it's, it's been the renaissance of the trades and, and particularly in the agricultural industry and, and sort of grassroots back into farming and, and people that provide for us over this little COVID lockdown, which, which has me fizzed. It's finally, it's just been the great level. It's all well and good that you can go out and earn 300 grand a year and drive around in an Audi, but, in COVID-19, you're looking at that bloke that's got his fancy suit and the chick saying to him, mate, how would you go if you had to shoot a cow for me? Like, yeah, we yeah, are, yeah. you're going to starve. We're not going to be able to eat those suits. It's like the apocalypse, eh? They, they, you look how you're going to, uh, who's going to flourish in that environment? And uh, they, they, yeah, you soon find what your middle is. But like you were saying with the trades, like I remember reading a fact a little while ago and it was like, if you started a trade at, say, 18, and your mate went and started, say, a law degree, maybe not lawyers, but like an executive degree or a bachelor of something, when you find and he started making great money, when you actually financially started to be on the level, it was more like around your late forties, and that's only yeah. if you just if you just like cruise through your life, both of you. So you're thinking, you know, there's not there's not too much in it, really. Oh, mate, I reckon I reckon that if you're a trader, you'd get there you'd get there earlier because I think that the way that you approach the world is completely different to how a, a mm. lawyer would, for example. I mean. And this is once again a sweeping generalization of lawyers and of tradies, but tradies kind of appreciate what goes into a house and they appreciate oh, what yeah, goes usually. into a build and they look for a bit more space and they kind of, you know, they, they know what they like. And at the same time, if you had a million bucks and you wanted to split it up, especially in Auckland, uh, a tradie could spend 600 grand on a house. You might be out in Cal, Cal Copper Copper or something like that, but <laughs> you'd have a nice house and a boat and maybe a Harley and and you'd have a sweet family and misses two kids and everyone's happy whereas if you're a lawyer your million bucks gets put against the house that's worth two million bucks you want to live in yeah. ponsonby uh you can hear your neighbors banging and farting through the wall next year because you're basically right next to each other and you're yeah. forever keeping up appearances and wearing suits so yeah, i, I see that as well you'd, like, you'd overtake the lawyer pretty quick oh yeah and, and then with like the trade i feel like being a trading myself like i find that you don't necessarily you it's more like you save yourself so much money because you can do a lot more practical oh, yeah. things yourself. Like you think the people who just are not practical at all, they just are constantly spending because they just have no skill whatsoever. And so it's may, it may be not be that you've got the money to spend, but you certainly don't have to spend it because you've been able to save it yourself. Does that make sense? And the biggest cost of life is generally in and around your home, which for New Zealanders is oh, yeah. your number one mm. asset. Like everyone, nobody's diversifying their fund. They're doubling down on their house. And if you work in the trades, uh, you've got mates that are sparkies. You've got mates that are, Builders, uh, you know, the Sparkies don't like to clean up after themselves, but that's okay. You guys know how to use a vacuum cleaner. The plumbers just like to gouge the guts out of everybody price-wise, yeah. so you're not going to be ripping yeah. yourself off, you yeah. know? So, it's, I mean, it all it's all very self-sourcing and it all works, whereas yeah. your average punter doesn't doesn't know too many tradies or, pop, you know, possibly. For me, I grew up at the Mount. All my mates are tradies. Like, every single oh, one of them's got a trade. So I love the Mount. Um, it's just a very long way for them to travel to do anything on a house that I'd that's in my top three places for an exorbitant amount of money. That's in my top three places of people to uh, places sorry to move back to if I ever move back to New Zealand would be. Would you move back? Out. <sighs> Depends if my wife's listening or not. If my wife wasn't listening, <laughs> I probably would. I probably would would at some stage. But if she's listening, hundred percent not. I'm more than happy here. 
But <laughs> we don't live in a bad place. So like Gold Coast is pretty wicked. Like it's an awesome place to live. Yeah. But there's just something about um, something about New Zealand. I guess if you grew up there, you only really understand it. It's a bit difficult to explain to people outside of it. But as a oh, yeah, and especially when all this shit went down with all this COVID stuff, I remember looking over there and thinking, "Wow, that looks like a safe place." You know, like I guess we're and I don't know if you've ever lived in Australia, but you just it's that much bigger that and and with that brings opportunity and with that brings like um you know op- opportunity to do things to travel brings all sorts of stuff with it but it also brings vulnerability too when it comes to the rest of the world and i feel a little bit like new zealand's tucked down in the corner of the world where nobody really it's not that they don't care about it but it's too far to care and any sort of conflict does that make you know do you know what i mean oh it is it is 100 percent, and that's why um like i mean whether you're whether you're labor or national voter it doesn't really matter i think that jacinda right in done an incredible job of putting her hand up and saying yeah. I'm drawing a line real quick on this, and I'm going to shut down the borders. And I know this is going to hurt this country because obviously we're a massive export. You know, we're a massive export um, country, and 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 a lot of our goods are imported. So it makes it pretty niggly for a lot of people operating. And there are people that won't come out of this. Like there is no two ways about it. That there is a lot of businesses that'll fold out of this. They're expecting projections at around sort of ten percent, which I think's on the light side of unemployment. And that's we've just. T- ticked over five million five whole million people live in new zealand um so that's yeah, well. you know five hundred thousand people that are unemployed that could possibly be working or or should be holding a job so it is it is the the isolation is kind of what makes it so special but at the same time like you said there's no there's it's pretty hard if you're a business owner especially if you're doing something like this we've got a booze company you need to you need yeah, to yeah. run a huge number to, to actually get some volume up to make it make it profitable if you're um, in, in another line of work where you're a teacher, you're never going to be short of work, and you're just mm. going to be getting those good old, good old fashioned New Zealand wages. That's why so many uh, Kiwi lads like yourself disappear overseas, and then you just run into some incredible looking birds and just put up with the accent, and then uh, you stay there. <laughs> put up with the accent, yeah, it can be a punish sometimes. <laughs> <He's all laughs> Once again, if the missus isn't, <laughs> yeah. if the missus isn't watching, I reckon you scrap this one. Just tell her it's yeah. not on the cards. Whatever you say, man. Hey, um, the whatever you're into, if that's what you're into, but the um, the and I reckon that's like lots of people don't say that about that Jacinda. Like I've never, I've lived over here for coming up nine years, so I'm a little bit out of the loop with it. My family's still there, but um, a lot of people not talking about what I've noticed, and I don't know if this is true of New Zealand in itself. They're not talk, they're, everyone's raving about how great she was, which she was, hundred mm. percent. But what they're not great uh, raving about, from what I can see, is that it could have broken her too. You know, like it could have gone on the flip oh, side. Mate. She could have, everyone could have just been real pissed that she shut the whole country down and she could have just been exiled and gone and no one, you know, she could have been the worst prime minister ever. So she put her balls on the line. I think there, there, yeah, there, and there was definitely a huge amount of that and there's still a huge amount of sort of disdain for her call and for how long we held it down. And I don't think we're anywhere close to the states where people are going to start protesting and marching and that sort of stuff. I think the other thing that helps her as well is that the opposition is so shit at the moment that there is no opposition. Like you could, you could be, she could have, mate, she's just untested and, and they, and they kind of aligned. But I think for the most part, she let the people get back first. She let the trades get back into it real early. Um, she's encouraged, she's encouraged people to spend. It's just, there's certain industries, particularly the hospitality industry that has been absolutely pumped by this. Yeah, and it needed a shake up. Everything needed a shake up anyway. So I think it's, I think it's good, and I think that people are looking at their lives a little bit differently now and going, "Isn't it nice that we got to spend? I got two young kids, I had to spend the best part of two months with them. I got a, I got a chill job anyway. I don't go to work till midday, and then I'm home by seven. So I've got a pretty mellow setup for the most part, and I can, yeah. and that's a full time job. That's a full time salary, so I don't need to take anything else on. It's purely for cream of, and over and above that because yeah. I just am at a at a stage in my life where I know how much I need to earn to get by and I've got that figure and we just we just truck along and we keep progressing but a lot of people man that's just sort of like just let me get back to work and the worst thing the fucking worst (laughs) thing when we finally came out of it after being locked down not being able to see anybody or do anything for four weeks the first thing that the majority of the country did was fucking line up outside the KFC and McDonald's drive through And I was like, if we're coming out of this, we'll be good. And then I saw that and I was like, it just reminded you there's such a massive part of the population. Like, if that's the one thing, if I told you four weeks you're not allowed to leave your house, what's the first thing you're going to do when you leave? For me, I wanted to go to the beach. I wanted to go for a surf. I wanted to go bush. I wanted to go into the, I wanted to go on the countryside. 
But yeah. for a majority of the people, they're just like, oh, fuck, I'd love a Big Mac and some fucking wicked wings. <laughs> fuck. Oh, my God. That just shows. But isn't, isn't KFC, isn't Dole Day KFC's big day? Well, I remember that yeah, was always a thing. It was always a Tuesday, and Hawks Bay, where I'm from, was always a Tuesday. And that's when that's when the KFC was pumping. Because I'd just be like, oh, we just yeah. finally, I've got a paycheck. I'm going to head out. And I suppose that's just indicative of exactly what they did after the COVID lockdown. Well, and, and it's sort of, it was so good because I walked back and forth to work. We live quite close to work. So it was nice to walk. So I walked past a street full of restaurants and yeah. I walked through a residential area. And it was so nice. I mean, I love the restaurants and they're, they're great. And I get around them because we're massive on supporting local at the moment and, and always have been. But it was so nice to smell because in the area that I live in, People, for the most part, will either go out for dinner or order food in on Uber Eats, and there's no food in a house long enough for it to create a smell because mm. it turns up in a bag, I smash it, it's gone. So there's no yep. lingering aroma of what's going yeah. on. But for the that last five o'clock, five thirty, yeah, when weeks, you used to walk through the streets and smell the meals, mate, yeah, mate, it's, and it smells amazing. I was like, how good yeah. is this? Like people are actually cooking again, and when you cook. It's generally a it's generally a social thing that you do. So you're having mm. conversations with your partner or your kids or you know the people that you live with that you wouldn't normally have if something just turns up and you sit down in front of a TV and smash it on your lap. So yeah, I'm holding on to those things pretty dearly, and 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 I'm looking forward to. I mean, obviously the the key and the goal for us is to move back to the mount, move the show back to the mount. So having this, spent the weekend back there last weekend, whew, mate. I'm more keen than ever. It's, Moving the show back. So how does that work? We've got because we've got studios all over the country, yeah, uh, and we just can log in from wherever. And so, oh, Petey right. Williams, who you probably remember, he was a newsreader. He's uh, he's moved out of the he's moved out of Auckland, where basically ninety nine point nine percent of the shows are, and he's moved out and he's doing a show out of the Tauranga Studios. And so he turns up in his golf cart with his cleats <laughs> on, and click clicks his way into the studio, knocks out his show, and then just goes off and plays the back nine at Otomoto. So it's um he's got it sussed. Yeah. So if he's he's kicked the door open, and I'm going to sprint through behind him. Yeah, well, that's the beauty of technology, isn't it? Like what we're doing here, you can be all over the show. They speak because I used to yeah. live above. And the um, audio quality back and forth is mega. Oh yeah, and you can almost because I remember uh, it was on Radio Hairaki. What was it? Was it a breakfast show? Um, the Morning and, Pirates. Yes, and what was one of the? I'm blanking. One of them did it out of Hawks Bay. He used to live above me, in an apartment block. Yeah, Woodsy. Was it Woodsy? Was it Woodsy? Well, there was Willie DeWitt. He was Willie DeWitt. Um, he was, it was Willie DeWitt. Covered. Yeah, it was Willie well, DeWitt. He was he, living in Hawke's Bay. He lived above me, and our daughters were the same age, so they used to play together. But he used to go then. He um, well, I, I won a few promotions, but um, the the he used to uh, <coughs> cut there. But we used to um, he would do it out of Hawke's Bay, and it was I sort of assumed that the whole thing was just they were all in the studio together. But he's like, oh no, no, one guy's in yeah. Auckland, one guy's over here, and I do it out here, and I thought, holy shit! And you sort of open, and it, it never sounded that way. Like it always just sounded like they were all together. So yeah, well, more... Mark Perry used to do it out of Mungify, and then, yeah, it might have been Woodsy that was panelling it, and then, yeah, Willie was down on the bay. And, yeah. mate, that was when I started radio, so that's, like, that's over a decade ago now. Like, yeah. That's a long time ago, and and it's yeah, the it was, technology yeah. is there. I mean, I think Kyle and Jackie O have been doing something similar in Australia for quite some time as well. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of shows that do it, one based, you know, Jason Gunn, Jace the Ace, he yeah. was based in Christchurch. <laughs> And then he was he was partnered up with um, JJ, who was working out oh. of uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, she's called she's been called a few. Sorry, sorry, yeah, I don't thingy. know. Yeah, I don't even know who you're talking about. I only know the big nose dude. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they did it as well. So there's no, I mean, obviously there's uh, there's no reason why we can't. It's just uh, it's just trying to change things. And this is what's been so good about the lockdown is that everything gets looked at now like everything yeah. gets put under the microscope can we do it better can we do it cheaper more cost effective where can we grow some business where can we gain, uh, gain some yeah. audience from and i think it'd be more people looking from we've, yeah totally yeah and and being more efficient with their time at home i know well, I'm, a, I'm a plumber by trade but i'm always out there you know like I, my life didn't change at all like literally did not change yeah the only thing i couldn't do was go out for a meal and like so selfishly from my point of view not much not much went down for me but like i, I actually did an online thing with a plumber from uh, auckland we did like an online thing as a comparison like an instagram live and i got a bit of grief from the kiwi plumbers because i was like look you guys and just like i was trying what i was trying to do was be positive like i was trying to like you yeah. know like it'll all be good you know you just gonna get back out there just not you know and i think they're like oh you don't fucking know how hard it is over here and i sort of i felt bad because i wasn't trying to 
I wasn't trying to, you know, belittle what was happening over there. It was more just, what do you want me to do? Sit here and be a pessimist about it and say, oh, you guys are fucked, you know? It's going to be it's going to be really tough here to get back into it. I was just trying to be positive. So I think a lot of people, like, we didn't do it as tough as New Zealand because we didn't have the full lockdown. But, again, what do you do? <laughs> Can't win. Well, mate, and that's the other thing. I think a lot of people have been saying too, and and I'm not saying that people are reckless with their cash whatsoever, but I think it's been a real good eye-opener for people to make sure that, you know, there is there is a little bit of fat there. Like there yeah. is, if things sort of go pear-shaped, you can go three months and sort of get by. And I don't mean live the life of Riley and, you know, go out for dinner every night, but I think if yeah. you can limp through three months and that's sort of almost before, I don't know, whatever it is, the luxury uh, item that you're wanting to purchase, if you can make sure that you've got that fat. So if something was to go wrong or, for example, I don't know, you needed something terrible happen to your missus or your kids and you wanted to spend time with them and they really needed that support, then you could up sticks and just and actually coast at that pace that you're doing at the moment for sort of three months or be able to pull somebody in to run that job for you. <clears throat> and yeah. that's what's the, been the, the number one thing for people over here at the moment is that they – they never thought that this would happen. No one ever thought that this would happen, but no. there, there was no, there was no accounting for it happening, and there was no backstops. And if you weren't considered an essential worker, then, mate, you were poked pretty quick because everything dried up, and even people moonwalking out of leases. And because what are you mm. going to do? Like I know people that have got leases on buildings, and they've gone from being like I don't know ten grand a week, and they've just said to them, "Oh, look, we can't afford that anymore." And the landlord's gone, "Tell me what you can afford," and they'll go a thousand a week, and they're just like, "I'll take it," because if you move out of a building, yeah, you can yeah. take them to court, but you'll shut <laughs> yeah, a business yeah. down pretty quick. And then, yeah. what are you going to repl- what are you going to replace it with? You better to have somebody in there that's limping yeah. through than just peeling out and leaving you with it. There's a lot of loyalty in that too. Eh? You'd like to think it would get paid back in the back end, you know, where they go, "Oh, these guys are loyal to us, we're going to stay," but not a lot of loyalty in business nowadays. That's the battle. Yeah, people are cocks. Pretty much, man. So you get the goal is back to the mount. I love the mount. I just, I'd love to. Get, yeah, I just love it. Papamoa, all along that area. I think, I think the mount, like their main mount strip, is exactly like Surface Paradise, yeah. but just uh, like very similar. It's like, it's like Diet Surface Paradise. It is. It is. Uh, and yeah. obviously, the meat, the meters aren't getting fed any longer. Um, but that's. Uh, it, it is a very good comparison. I think that's almost what it was modelled off. I, I would yeah. like to say it's more of a noosa than a, uh, than yeah, a surface okay. paradise yeah. um, because um, the surf's probably worse uh, and nooser than it is at surfers. But it's, mm. it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely a spot, and it's a great spot too because when I left, uh, it was basically just God's waiting room. It was a whole bunch of old people just waiting to kick the bucket sitting on yeah, massive right. sections, but now there's a, there's a bunch of young, and I say young, and I put myself in that category, people in their, in their 30s, say, yeah. uh, 25 to 50 bracket that have got young kids, so... Yeah the, yeah, the primary schools there were about to fold, and now they're at full rolls again. And there's a great community feel, and everyone sort of gets around each other, which is rad. And it's flat, so you can just tread me everywhere. Whereas in Auckland, it's a bloody up and down hills. Yeah, it's a yeah, wonder yeah. on the old push bike. And the Auckland's just got a thing about it. Eh? I just can't wrap my head around it. It's very uh, like like whenever people say, whenever people come over here, and I say, "Oh, where about New Zealand are you from?" and they say Auckland, I sort of go, "Oh." Like, <laughs> not the real Auckland like that's yeah. not the real New Zealand you're stuck in mind you there's plenty of parts of Auckland I haven't seen enough of Auckland to know there's plenty of parts of Auckland I've actually got relatives in Auckland I probably shouldn't speak too badly about it but well you're not wrong though because it's, it's most for the most part I'd say that I'm from I'd still say that I'm from Mount Maunganui but I've lived in Auckland longer than I ever lived in Mount Maunganui and yeah. it's it's just one of those things I just never consider myself to be an Aucklander because probably of that same stereotype that goes with it as well yeah there's nothing wrong with Auckland Auckland's got everything it's got it's got arguably the best restaurants. It's got the best cultural events. It has yep. the it has the opportunity to be the greatest city in New Zealand by a country mile, but there's a massive fucking naval base and a port smack right bang in the middle of it, and we need to palm off Eden Park and put a stadium down on the waterfront so we can actually have something hissing that oh, yeah, that you know, opens the city up. It'd be yeah, mega. Yeah. Yeah. Mega. It would be huge. That'd be the place. Yeah, yeah Auckland Auckland's could, could have like a vibe like Melbourne does. Melbourne's the same where it's like a pretty exactly. big metropolis. But Melbourne, like if you love sport, how much sport goes on in Melbourne? Like you've got the Grand Prix, you've got the tennis, the Melbourne Cup, you got the golf, you got pretty much every major event is run out of Melbourne. It'd be unreal to live there. And how, how is you get 90,000 people into the G and yeah. then the game finishes up and everyone just evaporates and there's, and there's just no sign of humans. Whereas you get... 
five thousand people go to the Warriors at Mount Smart, and it takes you two and a half hours to get out of the car park because there's just nothing yeah. in and around it. Same with Eden Park; you can't. Yeah, it's a nightmare. They just haven't done it properly. And no one gives a shit about league over there too, because I went to Melbourne once, and uh, the Warriors played Melbourne Storm that night in Melbourne, and I got the paper the next morning, like the Sunday morning. I was reading through it trying to look for the score. And like it was about thirty pages of AFL, and then in the back corner, the yeah. bottom corner, it said, "Um, oh, by the way, Melbourne Storm beat the Warriors." I'm pretty sure it was like a paragraph, <laughs> maybe a bit more. I'm probably being dramatic, but I just don't give a shit about it over there at all. And yeah, that yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, AFL for life, mate. I'm a Warriors tragic. I've been in that that abusive relationship for <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Years, abusive it, relationship. Can't get away from it, mate. Yeah. It is, mate. It's uh, every year because I can't. I can't. We've sat behind because I've had season. I've had season tickets for probably the last, probably the last decade. There's six season tickets a year, so if me and all the boys get to go, and we're sitting there behind this, sitting there behind this pommy fella, and uh, I was like, "Fuck, I'm done. I reckon I'm done. This year, I'm done." Like we would be ahead by <laughs> say forty points with ten minutes to go, and yeah. everyone's still on the edge of their seat, going, "We could lose it from here." And sure yeah. enough, we would lose it from there. And it's just like, I just can't do this anymore. And this Pommy guy said that was in front of me, turned around, he goes, I support the team back in England that my father supported, his father supported, my son supports it now. And do you know how many times we've won in four generations? And I'm thinking like grand, like grand final or whatever it was. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I don't know. If you're doing the numbers, that's probably about 60 odd years of support. I'd say out of 60 years, you might maybe get 10. You know, like that's, you know, not a, not a bad that's strike fair. rate out of yeah. 60. And he goes, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about uh, finals. I'm talking about matches. And in 60 years of support, they'd won <laughs> four games. And if, and when they won, the whole place, the village just like shut down for a week long bender. And he's like, you support the team that is your team and you never back out on them because you don't want to be the one that jumps off the bandwagon when that, yeah. when your team wins and you get to go on a week long bender. And I was like, you're right. I love a week long bender as much as the next man, so I'm going to stick with the Warriors. You sir are correct. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but they, they they should look into that. Four games is not enough. They got it. There's something wrong there. <laughs> did you did you, did you look that at them is... and go, well, that's almost not worth taking advice from that peanut because, well, like really, four yeah. games. You should like after two seasons. Like I, I understand the loyalty, but fuck, four games. That's just not enough. They must have been like a sixth div reserve grade, whatever yeah. it was. Like I was like, mm. mate, you must be scratching to get, uh, you know, like a team to take the field. But yeah, he um, it, it rang true, and I was like, hey, you're not wrong. You know, we've got to, we've got to stick by them. There is, and there's a number like that's what makes the Vodafone Warriors such a great team to support. Is yeah. our passionate bunch. The supporters, the core supporters, are a passionate bunch, and you see the same people there week in, week out, rain, hail, shine, absolute hiding. Sometimes we get on the side of a W, but for the most part, just watching the boys get pumped. And then, yeah. and it's then, the atmosphere. Uh, it's the atmosphere. Yeah. So I listened to a um, interview from, well, listen to or read, did a bit of research. Uh, listen, interview, and you referred to yourself as a trailer. Yes. Do you know what you mean by that? <laughs> I don't know if this is something you always do, but when I heard it, I was like, that's almost the best thing to be. Well, I talk to a lot of people and I find people interesting. And when you're talking to people about what they're into, it gives you an easier insight into what makes them tick. And as a result of that, uh, if that gels with what you're into. So I would canvas on average probably during a week, I don't know, probably close to a thousand people. I talk to, I talk to a lot of people. I think, really? And I'd say easily. Yeah. Yeah. I would. Yeah. You ask any one of, any one of my mates, it's a punish to go anywhere with me because I'll stop and chat to everyone because everyone, anyone that says hi to me deserves the time of day like nice yeah, unless nice. i'm under the pump and in a, in a rush yeah. uh, and even then i'll say hey I'll, I'll pick this up at a later date but i've been lucky to find people that are incredibly successful and driven and i get to basically coast in behind those people and receive the same accolades as those people say for example this this latest radio award duncan hyde is my co-host has won uh this award with every other show that he's done so he's he's won it before I started with with him, uh, he won at the show. Before that, uh, he is he is a consistently high achieving, high performing individual. And so when the job got offered to me, that was one of the things that I took into account. I was like, is this guy going to be the person that takes me to a point of success? And <laughs> yeah. I can, I can. I'm not saying that I'm lazy. It's just that I'm fucking lazy. 
Yeah. Uh, and I can I oh, can tactical. see how I tactical. Can, yeah. I will I will be the person that that drafts behind uh, whilst adding what it is that I can add, which is people to that mixer. So in our show, for example, he's got a great contact list. There's no two ways about it, but I'm I've been incredibly lucky to be connected after doing this job for ten years to mate, you you basically name it. I can track someone down or know somebody that knows somebody that'll vouch for me to get them on my show, which then adds value. So I've I've done it I've done it in business. I've done it. Um, I mean, this is mm. this is a, another classic example of a hardworking mate of mine that's yes, uh, doing that. incredibly yeah. well. And we and we jump in, and we're all mates from well, kind of mates, or we knew each other from in and around the bay. And as a result of that, it's turned into well, I would I would consider it a relatively successful business. Yeah, but yeah so that's that, a, it's. I mean, it's not that it's not the way that everyone should live. I mean, it's it is very lazy. I'd like to think that. I'd like to think that I'm not as shit as that sounds, but at the same time, I probably am as shit as that sounds. I think you're being. I think. I think you're not giving yourself enough credit. It doesn't just happen like. There's plenty of trailers that have flat tires. Put it that way. Like there's plenty of trailers <laughs> that just you are just people just drag along rather than you know to be a tra- here here. Here's where I think you should put it. You're a trailer with pumped up tires, so you're not. You know when you drive a trailer. It's not. You know, sometimes you don't even notice that. Sometimes you do, depending on your car. So if you're a big successful car, you won't notice much of a trailer. But if your trailer's got flat tires, yeah. it's a fucking punish to have them. <laughs> so there you so go. I've found you're an empty big trailer with flat. Vehicles. Not, yeah, you've flat found successful grunty vehicles, and you are a trailer that's empty, and you've got big pumped up tires. Yeah. So you're the <laughs> yes, perfect trailer. Exactly. Put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the perfect trailer. I get my tires pumped continuously. Yeah. And you make sure I'm just I'm I'm, yeah. I'm easy to drag along. You make sure they're at pressure at all times. And there you go. You're, you're, yeah, because a trailer can be a tr- trust me. <laughs> I got that's, an apprentice. There's no. a great adage that I will take. Yeah, good. You can use that. That's yours from now on. Thank you very Don't much. Don't say you got it then. Yeah, yeah. So pals as well. Once so again. Pals, one day, once, what do you mean once again? Yeah, once again. Once again, I've just hooked onto the... I can steal that saying and everyone's mm. like, fuck, it's a great saying. Not mine, but just a trailer. Just pick that up as it fell off the back of your you. Yeah, exactly. And now, so you, yes, you get that. But what I also have just figured out that I get is your context list. Yes. So by knowing you, there we go. Context list, done. I've just got myself a myriad yeah. of guests that I can call upon. You wait. 100%, you wait till mate. the phone I starts was, ringing. <laughs> you you let me know who you want, mate, and we'll see if we can make it happen. Give yeah. me a what's your what would be your top, what would be your top three hit list or top five hit list of people that you'd be interested in having a chat with? Okay, are we talking New Zealand? Let's just stick with New Zealand because that's your wheelhouse. Yep, New Zealand. Okay, I'm starting global. high. I'm starting high. Or global. Yep. I won't. I won't go global. Starting high, Richie McCaw. He's on the bucket list. Of course. He's on the bucket list, and why is he on the bucket list? And the only reason I ask that is I know him fairly well, and he's not the greatest of chats. He's a great bloke, but he's I, a shit uh, chat. But that, but there's method to that. So part of what I need to be skillful at is having a good... You're an easy guy to chat to. He's not, right? But there's skill in being able to chat to him, if that makes sense, and you'd know that too. So you mate, know, I'm like, his mate, and it's hard to chat to him. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Interviewing him. <laughs> Here we go. So he'd be... He'd be to- only yeah, he's a shit chat rocker. I, I see what you're saying, but he's still Richie McCall. You can't. There's nothing you can do about that. Two ways about it. He's a feather in the no, cap exactly. to be able to chat to that bloke. Uh, who else? Yeah, who else? Gee, you put one. me on the you put me on the spotty. I don't know. Uh, I don't actually know. I had one. I only just had blowing one. your load with Richie. I know. <laughs> and you've just put the kibosh on that too straight away by saying he's a shit chat. So I don't even know what to do now. Mate, he's getting better. Yeah, you, you, you yeah. enjoy it. He's a, mate, he is still one of like he is an the way that he operates. And that's the thing that fascinates me about him because yeah. I love uh, how his mind operates and I love how he yes. goes about his business. And he, I mean, I, I guess you guys are watching the last dance at the moment uh, with Michael yeah, Jordan. Yeah, you've seen half of it. Yeah, yeah. So that's that is how he that is how he operates. He's very methodical. And, and very measured in his approach. Yep. And he's uh, he's married to an, an old school friend of mine. Oh, yeah, and, right. And she is, she is almost the opposite. Yep. Um, she, I mean, she's got the same traits, but she's out the gate. Like, she's got great chat and just basically yeah. spends her whole entire Instagram life just mocking him for eating ice cream or whatever it is. I've actually, I actually follow her. She seems like a good sort. Like, she looks like she's great yeah, fun. Yeah, Jim's great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
But that w- and with- went to teachers college with her mum as well. Oh, jeez, look at you! All she, I'm show. telling you, mate, she's a small country. Oh, that's a small country, but that with also with like Richie McCaw too. Yeah, I, I was blown away by. I don't know if you heard you, but it was probably pretty big news in the Herald, I think, when uh, Kieran Reid's book came out, and he said that he Richie never ever ever asked about his family at all. Didn't know how many kids he had. Probably knew he was married, but they he was in a team with them for eight years or ten years. I think he said together travelled the yep. world, spent so much time. You know, at times probably spent more times with him than he did his family. He said he never once asked about my family. It was it was either we're speaking about rugby, or not at all, and that's all. Yeah, of... that's, I've had mates that have, I've had mates that have um, that have uh, sort of room with them in AB's camp, and they've said the same thing. But he's just that's what made him so good is that oh, he's, yeah. he's just business, and he has he commits himself to something one hundred percent, and so he committed himself to. Uh, representing that jersey and representing the country and leading that team, and even I've had mates that have played like if, it, Izzy Dags, he's great chat. He's a, he's, he's yeah. a person you should jump He'd be on cool. and chat with. He's a roost. He's from the Bay. You yeah, he's from a. He was. Uh, like I got mates. Separation. Yeah, I got a couple of mates and mates. He was at school. His school about a couple of k away from my school. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah. he's he uh, he had this he had this chat about they were uh, it was playing Australia and I think they're being beaten like twenty six nil in the first half. And there's a few young cats, including him, that were in the team, and he was like, they were panicking, like, how's this even happening? Like, yeah. obviously the the rivalry's sort of blown out a bit now, but it used to be, it used to be tight, and it definitely didn't go that way that often. Uh, and it was in Australia, and they were looking at, you know, all looking at Richie between the sticks after getting a try just before half time, and they're like, we're getting pumped here. And Richie just looked at all the boys and was like, we've got this. We stick to the process and we'll win this game. It's just, it's just that simple. Yeah. And as soon as he said that, Izzy reckons that he was like, oh, that's, Richie just said that we're going to win. So now we're going to win. <laughs> and then they came back and they pumped Australia like 32-26. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, and that is how he operates. Like he is yep. that steely focused. And now he's had a child. He's completely focused on being a father and being the best father that he can possibly be. Yeah. And being mm. the best role model that he can be. Um, for his kid, and it's it's impressive to watch. He's got hey, he's got control. That's the same he, with Cameron um, Smith and Storm. They like that. They reckon he's like that. Never, you never see him flustered, ever. Yeah. And I think that yeah, I think it's the it's same impressive. Thing. Yeah, really impressive. Imagine living with him though. <sighs> That'd be hard, <laughs> no, wouldn't it? Though he's in a band. Here's a here's a great chat about uh, Richie McCaw. He he play he plays the drums, uh, and so they've got this band. Him and a few of his mates. Who Richie McCaw plays the drums. With. Yeah, and he has a band. Uh, I didn't say well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for real? Oh, this, is, this is breaking news. Yeah. I've never heard of this. Yeah, so he had he plays in this band, and um, and so they play one song, and you'll probably be able to guess what that song is because he's from Christchurch, and uh, it was um, they were going to be playing "Have a Stab in the Dark." Okay, sta- it's got to be something the old. Christchurch song. Oh, see, I'm not. Yeah, it's got to be something old. It's got to be something you'd expect to hear at a country pub. Is it a, no, you're pretty much you're mm, very close. I mean, it could be a lot, like, maybe exponents or no, nah, is it not the exponents? Is it not Dave Dobbin? No, I'll put you the it's, it's not the gambler. Wheel. Wag- oh, okay, nah, yeah, right. gambler was the gambler is there because yeah. it's just uh, probably a bit too mm. long from the play, so they play Wagon Wheel. And they the most well, overplayed song in the history of songs is the gambler. I, 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 it does my head in when I hear it. Mate, they love it. Absolutely yeah. love that in Christchurch. So, so they so play wagon wheel? wagon wheel, and I th- and I think you'll find that if you listen to Wagon Wheel, there's not even a dr- there's not even drums on that song. But he is that good that he plays the <laughs> fucking drums in Wagon Wheel, and that's how good Richie McCaw is. Nice. <laughs> I feel like you just did a bit then. Okay, I feel like you just got me then with that one. I'm not even I'm not even kidding. And they were going to play. They had their first gig lined up to play at the Openaki Pub, and then everyone found out about it. So he just he, he sort of backed out of it. Nice. No, no. So he, he does play the drums. I've thought of number two. I've thought of number two on my list. Uh, yes. Is it Machu Walters? Mutz is the man. Yeah. Yeah. He's an absolute six sixty incredibly yeah. talented bloke. I was Very watching his lives uh, all through COVID. Yeah, he's um he's well once again, mate. This is uh the, he grew up with my he grew up with my now <laughs> wife. Uh, they're very they're very close, and uh, and I became good mates with them. It's uh, like a roller bunch of cats. That, yeah, it, it literally is. And his father uh, is a, is also a great bloke. 
big Hawani and he uh, a very successful lawyer, very smart individual, and and together mm. um, they've they've bought like they're very very successful, very successful pairing. But he's just um, he's one of the greats. Yes, he'd be he would be a great chap. He's a very smart guy. He does he listens to a lot of podcasts, um, spends mm. a lot of time in his own head, sort of sliding back and forth on on where he sits on things and. Yeah, he's a great chat. Mate, he's talented. How's the pipes on the bloke? He's pipe. Oh, yeah. He's no, he New Zealand's well. version of Matt Corby. Mm. He's a songbird of New Zealand's generation. Well, oh, he'd love that. There yeah. it is. I'll pitch Tell it to that. him like that. Pitch it to him like that. And <laughs> mate, he'll be on here in no time, surely. <laughs> Oh no! And then I tell you what, another one is Lab. I'm in the process of trying to sort Lab's over here in, uh, I think it's May, May. Ju- oh well, they're rescheduling it. They're going to announce new dates. So that's my. He's yeah. on my hit list for the Gold Coast in studio. I reckon I'm going to make. Yeah, they'll be good. Good lads. They go yeah. incredibly well too. They do go real good. good. Yes, yeah, so that's my. Let's go with that. My top three. Jeez, okay. Well, I'll, I'll, mate, so I'll here yeah, that Jace, we got Richie McCaw. Richie McCaw, the lead singer, of six sixty and Lab on next week. Yes. <laughs> Next week. Lock Perfect. it in. Lock it in. <laughs> I won't Lock hold you to it, it mate. I won't hold you to it. So tell me more about Pals. I'm interested to hear because this is uh, this came out of no well it came out of nowhere for me. I was like, oh shit, there's another beer. It looks it's look it looked like it wasn't one of those cliche boutique ones that you know they put out another. Oh mate, these well these are mm. uh, these little bad boys here. Well this is uh, we've we've done. Uh, how many we've got four of them at the moment mm-hmm. and so this one it was well basically we started it, here's the, here's the full story so about four years ago we were uh over in over in bali just doing the classic new zealand thing very similar to the australians mm-hmm. uh where we get we would go to bali and just absolutely watch the cheese slide right off our cracker for two weeks and yep. uh let our hair down and we a buddy of mine that was over there said there's a big uptick in rose wine it's very popular at the moment so how about we jump on? It's this great opportunity where you put four grand in and you get 40 grand out basically in four weeks. We'll just sell through and we'll just make it. And I was like, that sounds like a great little multiplier I can be a part of. And my wife drinks a lot of rosé, so this will supplement yeah. her drinking. Mm. And so we climbed into it. Uh, wasn't quite the case. Uh, <laughs> we basically chipped away for four years with this wine brand and we had a great winemaker. We've got, I think in our range at the moment, we've got a sparkling rosé, a rosé from the Hawke's Bay, uh, Hawks Bay Rosé, yeah, uh, and yeah. then we've got a, a Gisborne Pinot Gris, and then a Central Otago Pinot Noir, and then we no one would really stock us because we were sort of unknown and we weren't part of any of the big conglomerates. So we got ourselves uh, a supermarket license effectively, and we started slinging our own booze online, and then eventually it got picked up by supermarkets and bottle stores, and and that kind of ticked along, and then we're kind of having a refocus on what it is that we're wanting to do, and, and Nick Marshall, who's a CEO and just full time genius said um when we're trying to do a rosé spritzer and put it into a can and uh, the guy that was doing the formulation for us said i can get hold of um an alcohol base to make some rtds ready to drink options which are obviously big in new zealand not so big in australia because of that that rtd tax which is just fucking horrific frighteningly brutal yeah Yeah. and so we uh, we said about uh, we basically launched it in september last year we've got uh, a gin, Hawke's Bay lemon, cucumber and soda. And then we've got a Hawke's Bay lemon, lime uh, vodka, uh, lime vodka soda. And then we've got uh, bourbon, apple soda. And then what's the other one? And then like a watermelon, mint uh, yeah. vodka soda. And, and it teed off and we were like, let's dip a toe in the water. We'll see how this goes because it's a fairly expensive process to get into. And we managed to, we, we basically went in, all in for what we'd get for a year, what we thought we'd sell through for a year. And so we got the year's worth of booze produced and we mm. sold out in four weeks. And so oh, from really? there we're Shit. like, geez, we're under the pump and we've been chasing our tail pretty much ever since. Because that's almost the worst thing range. to do, isn't it? Because then you then like you got oh, the yeah. demand, got the demand and then you're like, well, shit, I can't really fulfill this. Yeah. Yeah, and then everyone starts to kind of get a little bit niggly. I mean, we've been really lucky. We've got some incredible well, everyone that sells our everyone that sells our products been really supportive, and we've and we've got a great almost tribalistic social following, which kind of helps it along. But um, now we're core range throughout the country, and there's we're well into the plans of uh, bringing it into Australia and uh, nice. North America, the states, well Canada, the states, and uh, and the UK and, and into Europe as well. So. Oh, holy she's uh, become a bit of a beast in a very short amount of time and it's a it's well this is like i've got mates like all my mates like i said are tradies and i've and it used to be 
that everyone would just be slamming beers uh, on the site Friday afternoon down till sort of three o'clock yeah. in the afternoon or whatever it is and, and start tipping a few tubes. And the boys that are now my age in their mid thirties are going, we're not moving as much and we're not on the tools as much. And uh, things are starting to really blow out because I just spend most of the day yelling at people or on the phone. And then my weekends, uh, hanging off a off a fishing rod, getting a line wet on a boat or whatever it is. So there's not a lot of activity going on. So I'm starting to podge up. So most of the boys, and I'm not saying all of them, but most of the boys have gone to drinking these, especially the especially the whiskey, mm. because you still get a head of steam up, but you're just not putting on the same amount of weight as because there's less than whatever it is. There's bugger all calories in this. Yeah, so calories. That's a big you thing. You can dust it? through. Yeah, well, I'd knock. I haven't done any. This is the only. This is the first summer I've been drinking them. Because this is the first summer we've been in and in, in and around, and uh, I would have dropped probably seven kegs that I'd normally carry through summer after just a good old fashioned send. So, Jeez. and that's the only thing that changed is that. So I've been living on barbecues and basically ethanol and uh, soda water, and it's bloody great stuff. Nice. I like. I like. Yeah. There's a little bit of open mindedness when it comes to that because gone are the days now. The trader that drinks beers all the time. Well, they're still around, but even like to the point where. I know that Red Bull gets involved more in like the trades and like the early morning stuff, being like in the trade stores because guys will instead of having a morning coffee, they're going to have all the younger guys are going in and smashing a Red Bull before work because they don't really drink coffee. So it's a different way of like looking at the industry. Yeah, and that's what we could see that this was. I mean, since we launched, there's been 27 different competing brands in the exact same market. So we're lucky to be holding our own we're lucky to trade through lockdown we're still uh, yep. we're still being able to trade through there because of that supermarket license that we had um which was great and a lot of a lot of the others will probably fall by the wayside or need to inject a massive amount of capital to limp them through to the summer but it's um it's good we've got a couple more flavors that'll be coming out soon and this is just a cool it's a i don't know we're, we're just making better choices and i think obviously this piss is piss it's not going to be seen as it's not super healthy it's not a bloody green yeah, tea yeah. you know yeah, but yeah, at, yeah. at the same time it's a bit better for you than than knocking over some sugar laden premixed bourbon yeah, yeah. and cola um, yeah 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 and exactly yeah, you still still get to enjoy it with the lads that's good that's coming to australia too i look forward to it what are we what are we talking or can you not say winter middle of winter summer uh, gonna be here for summer well we were we're pretty close and we're having some pretty good conversations with um the the big chains um, to bring it over it's just that it's just the alcohol excise it's ma- it's like 45 yeah. percent or something ludicrous which yeah. just makes it too expensive to to be an option so we're just trying to see what we can do to get around it there's a couple of ways that you can get around it but it's a bit sneaky and we're just kind of rather not sort of yeah, well, you can buy so that what are they 10 packs they're probably 10 packs yeah, aren't 10 they packs. yeah so they i mean over here like a four pack of like rtds Sometimes four or very rarely they the mainly the four packs they're like twenty five bucks. So you might as well just be drinking. Yeah, so it's, but yeah, it's for a ten pack. It's at Gilmore's. You can pick up a ten pack for twenty two bucks. Is shit really? And then our t- oh. yeah, and then our and then we're twenty seven ninety nine probably most other places. Fuck yeah, we we cop it here. That's yeah, rough. and that's the thing. Like it's it's all well and good to say, and I understand why they did it because it just stops all of that sort of stuff. But there was a it was legislation written a long time ago, and I think that it is a, it's definitely a healthier option than yeah. uh, than than slamming truckloads of beers. And I, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love me beers, but <laughs> this is this is my go to. Oh, no, it makes sense. Right? It's yeah. one of the perks of owning the company is you don't <laughs> have to pay for it, How which convenient. is very handy. <laughs> yeah. And any. Any can that gets dented on a shelf, it's coming straight to Reeves's house, mate. If it's not being <laughs> yeah. sold, it's coming here. I can I can drink a buckled tin. I don't care. So what's the go with what's the go with the rock moving forward? Are they um, you're on that show. How long have you been on that drive show? Just over a year. Just so that's over a year why now. it's all um, it, yeah, it's it's teeing off. I think the focus for us, <clears throat> obviously at the moment, the the music cycle that you can see, well, by, well, kind of how it works. A little bit of insight into the into the industry is that popular culture and popular music is sort of whatever sits in that pop top 40 thing you can see where it is cyclically so at the moment popular music or popular culture music so which has the mass appeal is kind of a weird electronic mix of hip-hop and justin bieber it's not justin bieber sort of per se but that kind of young yeah electronic music with a hip-hop element to it as well so it's about as far away as you could get from a rock music cycle because if you maybe wind back if you wind it back to 1991 say for example 92 93 
that was sort of Alice in Chains and Nirvana and Soundgarden and like you name it. Like there was there was a, just a real good solid rock cycle. So that same music would be playing on the rock whilst being played on a top 40 pop music station because that was the popular music of the time. Yeah. So we're well out of sync with where we sit because for whatever reason, people don't like rock music. So we're able to slide between, I don't know, you know, like good, great, great old stuff and all the way out to sort of new current stuff. Um, but a focus more for us now is how we kind of build a community in and around that as, you know, not only music, but what it is that, that makes great Kiwis and, and great humans. And so there's, it's not just, uh, send us a, yeah, send us a picture of your Mrs. Tramp stamp and we might give you a, a beanie and, you know, like, it, you know, what it used to be. Not saying that that's what it was, but. Oh, that's pretty close to what it was. Yeah. 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 There's, and now it's sort of, we're, we're probably, I would say arguably the biggest advocate for, um, men's, men's mental health and, and mental yeah. health in general. We had Bryce who does the, the rumble. He does our morning show. He raised 340 <laughs> grand, uh, on this spare change campaign that he did where he basically bowled for i think it was like 48 hours straight or something just like temp and bowling just rolling it down and um and with that basically bought hours of counseling time for teenagers the stats for new zealand uh, and men's suicide in general in new zealand are shocking so we're definitely trying to trying to wrap that out we've got uh, we're about to give away a twenty thousand dollar classic car we'll basically we've got a thing called the novus gc which yep. is uh the novus great car and if yeah. you're a gc that's a great chap or a great chick right, that has yeah. a gc a uh, great call or a great comment then you go in the draw to win this vehicle and at the end of at the end of that spell we just hand over the keys yeah uh, we've got a, a million dollar boat that's going in the water at the moment which is a show boat we get to go fishing on it and we chartered fishing trips on it so we're just trying to feed the backs like if we win then you win as a listener and that's yeah. why winning this winning best drive show was kind of like yes we're on the we're on the right track and it's not just us you know two little glory piglets standing out there going oh thanks guys it's sort of if you listen to the show then then you're winning we've lost a lot of the that tradey audience or the traditional tradey audience yeah because as you probably know there's i don't know these new apprentices that are going out and ticking up a new ute just doing bench uh at night and getting full sleeve tattoos and then train wrecking pingers on the weekend and they like listening to dance music so for whatever reason we've we've lost a few sites but Fuck. we've um we've uh, we've picked up the rural sector i know the exact uh, people you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's um yeah, it was a Dunny's Daily Motivators or something, you know, like not saying that that sort of that sort of clientele, but it's definitely I know I grew up listening to the rock and, and listening to Hodaki because my old man likes rock music and I like rock music as a result yeah. of that. My kids will like the same music as as I do. I can't imagine that I can't imagine being a father, put it this way, and going, Oh, mate, you know, when I was your age, I used to listen to this bangerang dubstep and just play Skrillex, you know, to yeah. your kids, because that it just melt their faces off and they'll be yeah. like that's a, that is you don't that give them music a seizure you can only listen to yeah that's yeah. music yeah. you can only listen to whilst on drugs yeah. and i've got a theory on that as well that <laughs> well, i grew up listening to black sabbath and pink floyd and all that you know that sort of generation of music which was my father's music and so there's a huge amount of acid that was taken in those times and um a lot of weed that was smoked and so the music are you talking about those times that. of the music or are you talking about those times to you listening to that music <laughs> <laughs> hey, be <laughs> honest. Yeah. No, those, hey, those times we're in the trust circle. Off. No one's listening. <laughs> the the time when that music was made, there was there was an indulgence and in the LSD and, and acid oh, yeah. and, and and exploring those sort of things. And as a result of that, you've got music that mirrored it. And so as we go through time, you can kind of see and, and make those tangible links between the drugs that people would take and how they would enjoy their music mm. um, at the same time as enjoying those drugs. And now. When you see the 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 uptick in how people are using, I don't know, you know, like pressed MD and 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 how people are in, indulging in that sort of that's that drug realm, yeah. the music reflects that because it's very hard to sit down and enjoy that music without being in some form of an altered state. And mm. I think the, the, the true sense. test of music for me is that I can listen to Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon absolutely out of my head or i can listen to it sober and it has the same effect on me it still has that same euphoric feeling whereas yeah you know, definitely can't sit down and listen to a full album of skrillex and go 
Oh, mate, I'm ready to go into today. I'm feeling bloody Firing. tip top. Yeah. That gives yeah. Me, it gives me a headache, that shit. But you obviously don't have daughters. See, that's the true test. When you have daughters, I feel like your song selection becomes really tricky because my I've got my songs on my phone and I've also got my daughter's songs on the phone. And there's it's like a mismatch of... And then also when she's playing a lot of it, I find myself singing along. And so I know all the songs. And it's just some sort of... I don't, I don't really know how to navigate it. It's quite difficult to... Because you want to let them... You want to introduce... So I try and introduce a few of my songs to her, like all the good stuff. But, mate, they just turn their nose up at it. End up putting on <laughs> whatever the latest thing is on TikTok. Oh, God. It's just, <laughs> and it's just easier. Yeah, it's just easier. You just... You know, sometimes with your kids, you just... You think, I'll just do it. I just can't. Like, I I'm not interested in trying to battle with you. Just play what you want to play. And it well, it's, I mean, that's the thing. The other thing is that those songs are successful is because they're written to a formula which is successful. And, and oh, I, yeah. I know the, I know the formula. But, I mean, I've got, I've got uh, twin boys that are six years old and they've been through that whole process. But I got in early. And there's, mm. so this is a trick for young players. There's a, a playlist on Spotify called Rockabye Baby. Um, and that is pretty much every single classic rock album that has ever been produced which is done in a lullaby form oh. and so you can find it and uh and it just seeds those amazing melodies so that they mm. they can pick them up and you can still see their ears prick up when you know they hear nirvana nevermind now was an album when they've oh, i remember yeah. this when i was a kid but yeah there's but no if, getting around let it go from bloody whatever it is frozen let it uh, yeah uh young manipulation young manipulation that's what that's called <laughs> that's what you've done how good is it when you're on site and you're in charge of the sounds and you just got it on you've got it on shuffle and it just well, it's goes not even like that anymore nowadays the blokes walk around site with just headphones on and they just really? got their own stuff going oh yeah well you know you know like footy change rooms they used to be they would have the boom box in before it you know and everything like that nowadays you look at like the the the, the um footage of them getting warming up and everything what do they all have on they all have headphones on there's not the camaraderie of it all like that where they get to you know the the captain picks a playlist or the or the most you know the, the biggest people on the team pick the playlist it's uh it's all pick your own or whatever is your focus the good it's old weird i mean you can you can't you come in sort of strange to you because i mean it's there is a um <clears throat> once again another outlandish theory but music travels in sound waves and we are basically receivers for everything so we pick mm -hmm. up these sound waves so they can make you feel a certain way and if you're tuned to those sound waves then you'll pick them up so some people you know when you hear a song you go oh mate i've got to play you this song geez it'll get you it'll get you straight away and you put it on and you can feel it and you're staring at this person you're like jesus christ you've got your your turn completely off here like you're not even yeah. even remotely picking up this tune and i like no it just does nothing for me if you find yeah, that music it just smashes it straight down the middle and picks everyone up like i can music's like a time travel machine for me i can hear a song and it instantly takes me back to a festival or a big day out or oh, sitting yeah, yeah. in a mate's bedroom like you know ripping cones as a grommet or being at a beach or you know pashing a chick or whatever it is it can music can take you there better mm. than a picture can you know like yeah, yeah you can't even see it but you know it and you feel it and it's imprinted within you and that's that's what excites me about music and that's why i love being a part of the industry Oh yeah, for sure. It smells like that too. I find smells like that. You know, you get to smell anything. Whoa, I know where that's from. I get that smell like when I smell hippies. It shits me. You know that smell, that hippie smell? I walk in and my wife's got this incense and it's the hippie smell. And she knows it pisses me off. And I walk into our house and before I even say hello to anybody, I'm like, you put that out. I can't do it. it, it I don't know whether I was beaten by a hippie or whether I was abused somehow by some sort of hippie. I've got a bad, there's something in my childhood that happened with hippies and it just puts me off and it's that smell i think they call it karma or something like that i got bad karma yeah. there's something wrong <laughs> okay i got huge issues it's like when you see someone with fire poise instantly you're like mm. oh, ah, there's someone around here dodging a shower yeah, really yeah. just uh skipping work and um just dreadlocks dreadlocks do life. the same dreadlocks and karma you, oh it gives me the chills makes me feel crook but the rock the rock seems like one of those shows where getting back to like obviously the industry you're in that seemed like because i know there's different radio shows and i'm not absolutely not trying to get you to bag any of them but they just seem like there's a certain demographic they appeal towards so i guess that's why the rock appeals towards a lot of the like guys yours my age you know and, and older and younger because and it just seems like with a radio show it looks like it looks like so much fun it looks like you just go in there and basically have fun all day yeah it is I'm, and i mean i'm lucky <clears throat> it was like an arranged marriage with me working with dunks and uh, and jeremy and, and young honey boner 
uh, when I just got thrown into the mix and it was like, well, let's just see if this works. And, and you're not wrong. It's um, that, that core demographic or the, the, the heart and soul of the rock listenership is rock music fans. And then yep. I guess my job or the introduction of me to the team was to see if we can, if we can pull from outside of that. So say if you've got a core audience like we've got, say 400,000, 500,000 people, then how do we grow that audience and how do we bring more people in? Well, the first yeah. job is to not piss off the people that are there because they're the foundation of which this entire station is built upon. And they're mm. passionate, man. Like the best thing about the rock audience is, and this is working, I've worked at, in pop stations and worked at Hodaki for, for a time as well, is that they're just unwavering in their approach. Like you can say, well, here's the latest, here's the latest Ford. And they would be like, I have absolutely zero interest because I'm holding and I cannot be swayed. And, if yeah. I said, you should buy Vans shoes, they're like, well, I've worn Converse my whole life and so did my dad, so I'm never going to wear that. And yeah. you just they just do what they do and they stick to their knitting and it's great. So what I'm trying to do now is find people that can filter into that and still and still actually appreciate the music but kind of almost look more into the chat or what we bring in terms of content. Um, and I'm from a farming background, so I wanted I wanted to sort of appeal to the farming, the farming community in New Zealand. And, and they are, once again, like the – people that are in the transport industry, whether you're plowing fields in a tractor or you're driving trucks on the road like this, you've got a lot of people that are with you from the start of your show to the finish of your show. And, and for the most part, the average time spent listening for your average listener is about 15 minutes. So if you hop into the car to shoot out and pick something up, you get one song, a shit chat and an ad break. You're like, mate, I'm not going back there. Yeah, yeah, So it yeah, needs exactly. to be something that kind of keeps hooking people back in. So there's a psychology in behind radio which is how they formulate the playlists and how they where they place ad breaks and how we tease into stuff and sort of try and keep you with us as long as possible. But at the end of the day, I'm the same. I may I listen to I, I listen I work for the rock, but I listen to every radio station because as soon as yeah. and I'm not saying that I love every song on our playlist. So if I'm listening to this, if I'm listening to any show, and some song that I'm not vibing turns up, I'm punching out to something else. Yeah, I'll come exactly. back to it because eventually yeah. I'll, I'll have the same problem more than likely fairly instantly with the other stations or find some chat that is equally boring. So I'll, I'll come back, but it just needs to be that, that kind of consistent approach. And that's, that's the best part about it is the amount of like people just go, this song's shit. I'm never listening to you guys again. And then they'll text you about 10 minutes later and just go, Oh, this song sucks. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> yeah. You told me 10 minutes ago, you're going, yeah. and you're still here. You're a mug. Let's have some if you're consistency. Stay, just stay. Just stop yeah. being a dick. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And then I guess that's what, like, what I said at the start. You know, your your show is sort of. I guess the beauty of it is making it look simple, and making it look like something you just yeah. can sit there and be easy about. You know, because you know, you know, like you, like you said, any, any sports person or any swimmer, like or relate to people you watch swimming. You watch swimming, and it makes it look like they're cruising. Like they don't look like they're putting very much effort in. Like they're flying, but they're not putting effort in. And that's sort of how it appeals on on shows like that where. You guys just look like you show up and just talk shit the whole time and having fun. People think that yeah. about podcasts too. Like, oh, how hard can it be? It's like, well, it's not as easy as it looks. It's just, you know, you've actually got to, you know, you've actually got to have, you know, have your wits about you the whole time. But it just, it should come off like you're just talking to a mate, you know, talking the whole time, yeah. talking to and, someone and making it look easy. And that's what we try and, that's what we try and do with the show is have a conversation that's relatable to the, to the largest part of the audience, and uh, and I th and we've just got to be genuine because if it's if it's not if we're not into it, we're not going to fake it. We're not going to lie because people know when you're lying, and they can you know they can tell pretty quick. Uh, but yeah, it's it does look simple, but it's it's one of those things. We I mean we run a pretty simple format. We all tap into this sheet, we go through, we plan the show out, and we just go. Are we going to have this conversation? Yes, no. For the most part, Dunks will say, I don't want to hear it. Tell me this. Tell me the story on air so I can actually react yeah. as if I'm hearing it for the first time. I want it to be the first time that I hear it. And we just got to trust in each other. It's like a game of tennis that needs to have somebody ha at the end of that rally, somebody needs to put in a kill shot that everyone in the stadium goes, oh, oh well done, great shot. Because you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. if it just goes boof and hits the net and farts over, everyone's like, well, oh, geez, that was a bit bloody disappointing, wasn't it? Well, it's a point, yeah. but uh, <laughs> it's hardly exciting stuff. Yeah. Not a teaser. There's no teaser there. Yeah, yeah. You want exactly. to see a, you want to see a you want to see a hell serve that gets returned and then somebody kill it at the end. So you're look you're you're one of those people who I think like you claim you claim to be lazy, you claim to be lazy, and you and you may think you are, but there's also structure in that. So what like does a normal day look like for you? Because I don't I, I I can't imagine it being sleeping into eleven, go to work at twelve, home by seven, beers yeah. till nine, bed. 
See, so this oh, is where no, you're going to be. Fa- no. This is where you're going to be found out if you're going to be honest about your day. So you not being well, a lazy my person. Day, you know, my boys, I t- t- my boys normally come up and wake me up when they get up, depending on what that time is. So it's sort of around about that six thirty ish mark. Yeah. Um, and so six thirty, seven o'clock ish. Uh, get the boys up, and then I, I do Wim Hof breathing every morning just because oh, it's nice. the one yep. good thing that I do for myself. Uh, make the boys breakfast, make the boys lunch, get them off to school, walk them to school because we live quite close to school, and then kind of make a few phone calls, do some emails. Obviously, you know how great I am at emailing yeah, with our, hot. our dealings. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of just select all delete, and the, uh, and the important people will call you. Um, and it's probably not a system that works entirely well, but it's one yeah. that I'm trying to develop and get everyone else on the same wavelength for it. And then, and then, or it's, delete half of the emails because you can't afford to have unlucky people in your life. Yeah, <laughs> it's just one of those. It's for me. I try and structure my day as as relaxed as possible. I try mm. and find as much time as I can to get to the beach or to to go out for a fish. Uh, at the moment, we're kind of under the pump, trying to get a few things uh, up and off the ground. We've got a, a pretty big project that we've got going on. Me and a, a buddy of mine that runs Movember over here. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of that's sort of hissing away. Powers takes up a little bit of time. I'm not talking about it on brain cycles, but I'd say powers probably takes up maybe one to two uh, percent. This new project would have maybe ten percent, well, and then yeah. the show would take up the majority of it. And and you're kind of always thinking about the show punching punching it in about i cook myself lunch at home co-host turns up we normally have a feed here plan the show out for the most part and then i'll see you uh, from home then, well i plan here we try and plan at my house because it's on the way to work for him yep and it's close to work and and then we don't have any outside distractions from in the office because there's a lot of people in the office and they've got a lot of stuff that they want to chat to us about yeah and we can speed that process up and say uh, you need to have a chat with us. You have kind of five minutes, and we can sort of knock it out. But we're very, both of us are very social, and we and we, yeah, and we're the ones that drag the conversation longer. So we can almost do it to sort of mute ourselves a little bit, mm-hmm. and then get into work at about one o'clock. Plan to show up. He knocks out the weathers. I'm I'm beverage master. I'm the beverage specialist in our team. So I uh, go and make us some coffees, uh, fill up drink bottles, <laughs> sit down, yeah. and then, and the then water we boy. just wind into it at pace. Yeah, yeah. I'm literally, I am. Bobby Boucher I'm of, the rock, Sandler, of the Rock yeah. Drive Show. <laughs> Jay is, Boucher, Jay Boucher. Lucky. Yeah, that's yours again. That there you go. A, a second gift yeah. from me to you. Yeah. Jay Boucher. We'll mention these tomorrow. This, yeah, good. This, this is, uh, we'll, we'll mention these on the show tomorrow. But that's, yeah. And that's basically my day. Get home. show finishes at 7. Get home. Uh, the boys are normally at dinner. And read them story. They go to bed and then yep. sort of decompress from the day, catch up with the missus, cook dinner because I like cooking. It's sort of how I unwind. And then, um, yeah, do I, do I check out a couple of other things that I'm trying to chase. In. I'm trying, this is the year, 2020 is the year to say no for me. I'm just, yeah, someone's right. like, hey, I've got this idea. I'm like, fuck, that sounds mm. awesome. Let me be a part of it. And then yeah. you just end up spreading yourself too thin. Cause you I don't, end up jack of all like trades, master of none, isn't it? When you, you start doing shit like that all the time. Yeah, I mean, that's, and I'm not even not even a jack of all trades. I'm just doing a million things shit as opposed to one thing great, and that's sort of the focus. Oh, mate, I know that feeling. Something shocking. That's a, <laughs> that cut me to the core. That one. That's like a, a <laughs> conversation the, I have with my wife most nights. I feel like I'm doing shit at everything. <laughs> I might just quit it all and just do one thing. Okay, it's about all I got in me. But if you look at people that are successful, I think there is there is a certain element of that that they just zero in on what it is that they need to be good at and they become mm. great at it and if you've got a hundred percent of your time and you chop that up you can't give a hundred percent to 50 different things like yeah you can only spread yourself you know across a certain amount of sort of certain amount of vocations and then on top of that it's kind of the whole point the way that i look at it as you trade a certain amount of your day your time for money and you mm-hmm. the reason why you do that is so that you can afford yourself the opportunity to do whatever it is the fuck you want to do with yep. people that you love and care about in your spare time but what ends up happening is that you trade more of your time for more money and then you're left with no time and then when someone says to you oh how are you going oh mate i'm so busy oh mate i'm just absolutely flat out yeah. it's like, well you're the reason why you're flat out but like, you're the reason why you're busy and it's up to you to balance that out and if you don't have that balance then it's no one else's problem but your own because you're the person mm. that can make that happen like nobody's working a hundred hours a week and just getting by for the most part i mean obviously some people are working three or four jobs and working incredibly hard 
but there's always it's everything's got a choice i've read this read this book recently called the subtle art of not giving a fuck and it's great because yeah it just reiterates to me how i operate my life there are choices and you can choose to be busy and always chasing your tail and chasing an extra dollar or you can go this is what i'm into and this is what i need and when you find out where that sweet spot is which is where i'm at at the moment mate life is good because you're just not stressed and you're i feel not like you're late. talking exactly to me I feel like you're talking directly to me about that. <laughs> I feel like you're like a counselor. And I and I say that I say that you get to exactly where you are and you're not late. And then I was an hour and a half late to uh, the first time we were meant to catch up, which is fucking yeah, rich for me. And I, I apologize know. for that. That is shit. I was getting most upset just, as you I'm, were claiming about how you're on time. I thought it was yeah. full of shit. <laughs> Don't say it just for the people listening. I've had you yeah, you've been had. There's a there is a cert, there is a certain amount that you that you choose to give to everything and yeah. i think for me the most important part is how i spend my life with my family and my friends i'm sick of i'm i mean and i like i've got some great acquaintances too but i mean even as even down to like i've got this incredible relationship with harley davidson i'm so so lucky and it's i started riding with my mates and we used to go away a bunch and we used to heaps of cool shit and go to these big ride out camp outs and and these big weekends and then i had this built this relationship with harley davidson and now I've got a sweet ride and a sweet deal with them, but I don't get to ride with my mates. So the times that I get to go away, because I've got a family, I've got other commitments yeah, and I've got right. other hobbies. Mm. So I've got X amount of time that I can dedicate to riding motorcycles and I'd love to dedicate that to riding motorcycles with my mates as opposed to going away for weekends and shooting videos that'll be posted up on social media. And, that, and they're great, a massive first world problem to have. But once again, you've got two choices. Do you want to spend this much time that you've got riding with with a company or do you mm. want to spend this much time you got riding with your mates and yeah, it's yeah, yeah. and it's quickly becoming you know fairly apparent where where i should be spending my time and it feels shit when you're doing it sounds like you you've got a real like moral dilemma when it comes to like a financial decision as opposed to like a, an emotional decision with that you know like you think well, no, oh, financially totally. it's the best thing to do is to stay with harley but the emotional decision just well what got me to the dance you know it was was spending time with my friends and it being like a hobby side of things rather than a financial side of things. Well, it's all, the way that I look at it now is that if money is the if money is the answer, then it is ninety nine point nine percent of the problem, and that's mm. like you can you can, I mean, it is the oldest. We are we are prostitutes of our time to whoever wants to pay for it, and mm -hmm. and it's just how much how much does it cost to get fucked? So you you know you get the money, <laughs> yeah. but you. You, you, you trade it you trade it and there's always a cost whether it's a, an opportunity cost or if it's a career cost or it's a financial mm. cost or a relationship cost there's always a cost and how are you going to offset that and where do you want that cost to be landing and for me i don't want it to be landing in a relationship cost i don't want it to cost my family i don't want it to cost my friends i'd rather it hit me in the pocket because i don't know I'd, I'd there's, a, um, right. I'm doing there's okay. a podcast that uh, uh joe rogan did with um Naval, his name's Naval Rev Rev. Oh mate, he's amazing. Rev, yeah. oh, you know the one. Yeah, that that you're sounding a lot like like that. That's some of the things that I heard through him as well. Heard them, thought they were a great idea, put none of them into practice. So that's the difference between you and me. But um, it's like. But you're trying something different. Though. That's the other thing, though. Is there's like this. I'm guessing this isn't when you. If I said to you five years ago you'd be doing this, you'd be like, mm, oh, don't know, don't think so pretty yeah. keen to build my business be successful at what i'm yeah, doing that's right. but there's there's something we don't learn new skills like when was the last time you would have gone through your apprenticeship you would learned everything and then you would have started your business and you would learn how to run a business there's a part of your brain that needs to be triggered to learn stuff and if you don't mm. learn things then it's almost it starts to get lazy it's just the same the same same as any other muscle in your body yeah that's and right. with the event of cell phones and not having to remember phone numbers and you don't even need to have general knowledge anymore because how many times you said to somebody, oh, what's this? And they just, oh, just, I'll just Google it. Like, no one mm. knows shit anymore. Yeah. Like, good luck being an encyclopedia salesman at the moment. Things yeah. will be fucking real tough at your place. You know, <laughs> like, it's just, yeah. it's just the way that we operate now as humans. And I just don't, well, I don't know. I just think we just sort of trend, trend a little too hard towards tech as opposed to yeah, well, uh, that, relationships and, and making calls. A lot of that, like what you said, is more, I, I got into an uncomfortable position where what I did wasn't um, a passion for me. And so then, and that, that's something like a little bit inspires me about what you do, 
as you sound like a lot of your decisions and a lot of what you chase in life is based on whether you think that'll be fun or whether you and whether you, you know like you said about the trailer you sort of tag on to everything that could and couldn't be you know beneficial to you but i bet you they don't attract your attention if they're not something you think would be cool like you don't look at something and go oh i think that'd be financially worthwhile you're like i'm going to enter into a drinks company because that'd be cool and that's what i'm interested in and that'd be fun you know it's sort of like and and then and therein lies the passion and the ability for it to be something rather than if you just if someone said to you oh hey i'm um jono from britannica and we're going to be um encyclopedias i see they're going up in the you know in the next couple of years you're like i'm just not interested in encyclopedias yeah. at all so you're never going to be part of that are you but when it's bo- booze and harleys fuck let's do it you know and and then, then yeah, the passion well, mate, goes with that yeah I've, and i've made that mistake i've jumped into i've jumped into businesses and uh and and sunk considerable amounts of money into things just to try and buy myself a career or buy a side mm. business that will make it easier for me in the long run and and found that a, there, there is no there is no reward in that whatever financially or or even you know fulfilling of you know what you need to tip your cup up uh, to fill your soul up so for me everything is done on purely uh, we'll do this we'll do this because it's fun first yep. um, and it doesn't cause me stress and then we we'll always find money you can always find money in a situation yeah like it's, time. it's always there to be made but it's you can't you can't really force it the other way around it's not very often that you go okay here's a um here's a hundred grand and you've just got to wait around in your own you know like in a in your own pool of shit or whatever it is and it eventually it'll get fun you know like yeah. it just won't yeah yeah it's, it, you, you can't just take that because there is that there is that trade-off whereas if i approach things or i tend to approach things with this is going to be good times like even when i got into the radio the radio station they're like we'll sign you for you know like an extended term and i was like how about i do it for a year and if i like it and you like me, then we'll renegotiate what that next mm. term looks like. And when it came to renegotiate, they're like, "Well, that's a pretty punchy figure you're throwing out." And I was like, "Well, that was because that was the prototype. That was a one-year prototype, and now you're putting that prototype into production. So yeah. you can either throw your weight behind it, or you can find that I will once again give you as much as I can give you for that amount of money because I'm not going to give you everything, mm. and I'll find other ways to, to supplement my income. And that's yeah. And this radio I'll award bitch says different. That's what you said." Yeah, <laughs> I've slapped it down on the yeah, desk. Yeah. Go, oh, what do we have here? Yeah, money. yeah. <laughs> Sounds like like. No, and it's not about what what you live your life towards. Cash. Sorry, you go. It's not about the cash. Well, it's just not about the. Yeah, it's just it's not about the cash, and it can't be. Obviously, you need something to keep the wolf from the door. But yeah. that's why we look at it. That's why we look at doing things like the the rationale and behind moving the show to either regionally or back to back to the bay is that. If you're trying to get somebody to operate on your show, you say, "Hey, Mister Andy, for example, like they yeah. they are the gold standard of of afternoon radio or radio full stop." And the reason yeah. why they are so good is because they've got an incredible team around them, and that that team is what makes that show. And yeah. so, for us, if we had somebody that was uh, continually cutting and creating social, and then someone that was working ads for us and doing integrated solutions where we find brands like. I know Makita and we do because we do a bunch of stuff with these mm. incredible brands and they've got great money. If you've got a person for each one of those roles uh, and you want to have those people live in Auckland, you'll be paying them about 40 grand a year and that would pretty much leave you a 70 bucks a week at the end of you paying yeah. rent and your living costs. And it's just not feasible. Whereas if you were to move that entire show to Tauranga or the Mount, you could pay them the same amount of money and they'd make it, they'd make a better living out of it and therefore yeah. you get higher more qualified candidates so mm. if you want to sh- lift the show from here to here the reality is is that you can't leave it in auckland so you need to look at other options and and then when you put it out like that when you you know lay your case out then the the management are like well you know you've got a point and then fucking what's the worst thing that'll happen we just fucking move back to auckland and we know yeah. that it works so yeah. you know you've got a backstop let's just yeah. let's just try and do things differently just because you've done it the same way imagine if nobody Imagine if nobody thought about trying to invent electricity and there was someone walking around with stilts lighting fucking lamps in the street still. Like, it's just <laughs> ludicrous. Like, you can't yeah, keep yeah. doing shit the same way. And also, yeah, and this, this time's the best, but like you, you speak, like the way you speak is a lot like an analogy I use. Um, the guy, Aubrey Marcus, um, I heard about it on a podcast he does. He said there's two types of people in this world. There's squirrels and there's bears. And a squirrel, and I'm not talking about the bear, like the gay bear that, you know, gay guy with the beard i'm talking about like a beer like a proper beer so you're like a beer so 
A squirrel is someone who has money and has <laughs> things they need, and they squirrel it away, always keeping it away, always keeping it, saving it for a rainy day, you know, like making sure, oh, shit, I better have, and probably a lot more squirrels now with all this shit gone down, because you feel like you've got to have a nest egg, got to quickly have this. And then there's a bear, and a bear is someone who lives off their fat, and their fat is by relationships and by sort of, you know, being good to people and investing in people and making sure, you know, being a people person and, and speaking to people and you invest in all these people and you and you can live off the winter. And when the winter comes, the squirrel is living off what it's squirreled away, whereas the bear lives off the fat and the and the goodwill basically that it's developed. I don't know if I'm doing a good enough job of explaining it, but and and someone like using yeah, bear I'm without a, like Yeah. Yeah, I get it. I'm a I'm a massive uh, I'm a massive hairy homosexual man that uh, gets by on that's exactly what I was trying to get across. Will. But the, who was his example too? <laughs> Handshed. His example too was like Willie Nelson. So Willie Nelson had a farm wherever he was from. I don't know where he's from. Somewhere in the states. Let's say Texas. He must be from Texas. And he's got a farm or a ranch out there. And basically, he never paid tax. So they took his farm off him. Said you know, he, they confiscated it basically, mortgage sale, whatever it is. And he'd done so much for the community, and the community lived in. Everybody banded together, and when it came up for sale, bought that farm and gave it back to Willie Nelson. Because he'd invested yeah. so much time in everybody and so much time in like, you know, he was that bear with all that fat that that came back and, and helped them in the long run. So being a people person, being someone who's invested in other people, being someone who cares about other people and being someone who, you know, is 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 always for other people, that's an investment in and of itself. Yeah, I think it's, uh, someone said to me, I can't remember who it was, but uh, use things, not people. And that's, yeah. that rung true with me because so many people, particularly in Auckland, because it's a pretty fast moving pace and mm. you go to these events and people are talking to you and then they're kind of looking over your shoulder for the next person oh, that they're going to sort of pause and swing to. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I, and it used to annoy me, but I, I kind of, I, I can appreciate why they're doing that because that's the, that's the hustle in which they are operating in. And yep. you quickly realize that those are people that you don't necessarily need to have that many conversations with or, or limit your time with them. But that, mm. that, that doesn't make that, that doesn't mean that they're bad people. It's just that they are looking for somebody to use for their own personal gain. Yeah. And the person that they're looking to swing to is going to provide them with more than you. And people operate that way. And I'm just saying that I don't operate that way. My, my interest is yeah. purely in people first. And, and Matt, I know, I know so many incredible people uh, that do amazing things that you would never ever know or never or most people would never give the time of day to for whatever reason and and those are the conversations and those are the people that you find that just absolutely light you up and that's like i'm just i just trade and i just love chat more than anything but i just i you know, have a huge huge amount of interest and in, and in people and what they do and how mm. how they get to where they are and their and their sort of stance on things and you, you always find people that have just got incredibly shit chat or very very skewed and weird views <laughs> yeah. uh, but, and if you can't pivot on something too which is i think something that i've learned from i guess a lot of podcast listening and that have challenged the way that i see things and the way that i talk about things and the way that i operate and my wife in particular is she's like well, we're growing we're growing you know young men we need them to be better young we need them to be better yeah. males and that starts with that starts with you and how you role model those things and and how you talk about others and how you operate and, and how you're empathetic and how you care and, and what you do and so like it's the toughest thing for my boys over this whole lockdown thing is that we they can't walk past a piece of rubbish without picking it up because we grew up at the beach or they grew up at the beach for their formative years and they know that if you don't pick that rubbish up it goes into the ocean and that's where that provides us with 99.9% .9 of our fun and sustains us. Mm. So now we're in the city and you can't touch any rubbish because it's like, someone no, decided I, to eat a yeah. bat and fuck the whole world. Like, it's just yeah. weird, you know, like you're just trying to explain to them, hey, boys, don't pick that rubbish up. And they're like, but there's rubbish there. It's like, yeah, I know, but we just, we just can't pick it up just yet. We'll get to a point where we can we can do this. And they're like, well, it just looks terrible. We took them to Bali, blew their minds. They're like, oh, oh my yeah. God, Brutal. look at all this rubbish. <laughs> Jesus, what's going on here? Do they have no kids? Who's picking yeah, yeah. it up? That's a good lesson for kids to go to Bali. I remember we went, we went to like Bali and then Fiji, and I was like, these. We went into, we took a bus from Fiji all through like the town, uh, the towns. And you're going through like these very, really, really almost third world, you know. I was like, and you piss and moan that I ask you to empty the dishwasher. These kids don't have a dishwasher. Yeah, they don't even have running water barely, and that sort of that lasted like a week after we got back, and then that was back to moaning, you know. 
shit again. Yeah, yeah. they did that to themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we um, it's that's. I think if you travel, the more you travel, the more you get to see, especially to to places where um, English is is not the first language. And then when when you're talking to when you're talking to even Bali as an example, you can have a conversation with a Balinese person, and and the amount of people that I've seen that grates me when we're in Bali just go trying to just yell at them in English like, "Do you not understand what I'm fucking saying? I said how much for fucking two pairs." And it's like yeah. the the reason why they don't have great English is because they speak more than one language. You fucking idiot! Yeah, like yeah. you're the person that is behind them. Like they speak probably two or three local languages and yep. then english is an, on top of that like what can you speak you've got a shit command of the english lang- language and you're firing up at them about yeah. their mis- their, their inability to communicate yeah. with you sort of the more you travel the more you visit places that don't speak english the more you appreciate a what it is that we've got where we live yeah uh, and b what goes into you know providing for you and your family and how and how lucky we are to have it Mate, if you're wearing shoes you're in the top five percent of the world's richest like it's but states like that are just like, mate, that is phenomenal. And with those people in Bali too, though, you've got to remember that you're in their country and you're yelling at them because they don't speak your language. They should be effectively yeah. yelling at you because you're not trying to ask them in Balinese how to, you know, where, where, yeah. four bintangs, please, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Yeah, it's, um, it is the way it is. It is mate, we could solve is, a few of the world that... problems, couldn't we? Oh, mate, we're, we're, we're going well. And I think that... that with all of this lockdown and how we how we now view the world and how we're probably going to tighten things up and shop a little bit closer to home and appreciate, you know, the amount of people that all of a sudden are appreciating the rural sector because nobody wants to go and get their hands there. It's like if yeah. you had to, if in order to eat meat, you had to line up and watch a cow be shot or taken. You'd never watch it in it. You'd never watch, mm. you'd never choose to watch it. I don't know if you've ever been to a slaughterhouse, but... You would never want to go to one of those big freezing works and see that operation. And I understand that we live in a society where we need to consume that much, and that's the most efficient way of getting it done. But, mate, most people would just put down the knife and fork and be like, I can't do this. So those people that toil and get up early and do those long days so that we can sit down and, and... and have a steak on our plate that comes in nice plastic packaging or you yeah. grab it from your butcher or whatever it is, like there's a whole new appreciation for those people and for, and for the people that provide us with vegetables as well. And then once again too, like all of a sudden, how oh, you it would have been a little bit different in Australia, all of a sudden someone's toilet gets blocked and you go, oh, mate, I'm not going to be able to make it because, you know, we're in lockdown. All of a sudden yeah, yeah. they're like... Mate, you, I will, I will give you everything. You have a have a hoon on the missus, take a car, and here's the ten thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, you know, like the, Oh, mate, we still get it. We still get it. Like, yeah, you, we still get it. So, like in that industry, whew, like people are just your best friend. And then you get the people who also complain about the price. And I've now, what I'm going to do, the next thing I've thought, next time you go to a block drain and someone complains about the price, I'm going to say to them, look, here's the deal, I will charge you half price. Half price. This whole thing will be half price, but you're going to do it all hands on, and I'll just guide you through how to do it. So grab, you know, grab, so grab all the stuff now. Um, half price, promise you. But in fact, a quarter of the price. But you have to touch everything and do what you got to do. And I'll, I'm going to see how many people shut their yappers about this shit because that annoys the f- fucking piss out of me when people do that. Oh. They complain. It's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When you someone's be doing shower it? traps blowing out, yeah, yeah, fuck no, I don't take my money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's like if yeah, so you have to crawl under somebody's house, like yeah. crawling under, crawling under your own house, and going into the water, the scum and piss that you have produced because you couldn't be bothered getting a, a plumber to come and fix it the first yeah. time, and you've just let it go and go and go and go, and now there's a swimming pool of dead skin cells and, and a thousand showers underneath your house. Yep. And, you, and you're pissing and moaning about somebody having to climb under there and fix it. So, uh, that's yeah, a bit, you it's do a bit it. cool. Yeah, you do it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Mate, there's people out there. Oh, <laughs> I've just... got an idea. You do it. <laughs> yeah, there's people that complain about, oh, yeah, anyway, I could, go, I could go deep in that one. It's just the way it is. Mate, I've taken up enough of your time tonight. I feel bad. It's a, it's a late, what's the time now? Uh, nine o'clock. Uh, what's your time? Mate, nine, it's mellow. Mellow. Night time. You got plenty more. And you didn't even bring any spare drinks in the booth with you. No, I'm not far from the fridge, but I've tried to. I've definitely tried to taper the amount, mate. When you've got, when you've got access to free alcohol, it's yeah. probably more of a, um, an exercise and being able to steer clear of the fridge that yeah. that you reward yourself with, as opposed to cracking another tin. Mm, I know that. 
<laughs> yeah, after you get home, you're just that like, being oh, said, I'm going to go dust a couple. Yeah, good for you, mate. Well, no, I appreciate appreciate you coming on. Like we finally finally did it. Took a little while, but we got there in the end. And uh, I don't think it was too bad. You're the uh, you pop the cherry of the online smoko uh, online smoko podcast. So congratulations. Hey, mate, I'm uh, very appreciative of uh, for getting the call up, and it's um it's it's definitely been a it's been a fun chat, and I look forward to seeing. I've been I've been listening to a few of them, and like and oh, nice, thank you. There's, there's uh, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. It's a slick setup. Thanks, mate. Yeah, we we got a good setup in here. Thanks to Jace, the producer over here. But, mate, next time you're in the Gold Coast, if these borders open again, um, I'd love to have you in studio. And uh, you were over the Gold Coast a little while ago, weren't you? Were you in? Uh, I came over for Shawnee's wedding in Byron. Byron, so, yeah, okay. Going, so you were close. Coast a bit. Yeah. yeah, you're in the Hippieville. Yeah, See, that's we, where um, you won't catch me there. There's a lot of incense and dreadlocks yeah. there, mate. I can tell yeah. you. Yeah. All those fucking those fire poison fire sticks and. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of uh, a lot of Thai fisherman pants. Yeah, nice. Yeah, well, we're, next time you're here, mate, we'd love to have you in the studio and um, uh, get it going again. Good chat. Yeah, we're trying to, we're trying to get over now that they've sort of released the uh, the dates for the supercars. It will be it be good to get over. We'd like to take it. Well, Murph's a good contributor to the show, so we'll oh, nice, try yeah. and drag the Murph in as well. I think they cancelled it. Didn't He's they? always good chat. No, they've already they've put up the new date. Oh, they have. Yeah. Yeah. Oh well, mate. Supercars in studio. We got Jace. He's the motorsport two guru Bathurst over here. As well. Yeah, two Bathurst. Yeah, yeah. He's a motorsport guru. He'll show you the way. All right. Hey, we'll go well, lads. Appreciate the chat. And uh, yeah, if you ever make it back, mate. If you ever make it back. Yeah, I'll call you up uh, next time well, I'm in Murph's, Auckland. <laughs> yeah, mate. Well, Murph's based down in the Hawks Bay as well, and he's hanging out to do some podcasting, so you can set up a studio with him. Yeah, nice. Exactly. Oh, really? Is he? Yeah, Jeez, he's full that. time nice nice yeah well yeah i mean it's the way to go it's just about getting the studio sorted and there's heaps of um now that we've sort of unloaded this online sort of portal um jace has been sorting it out i can sort of open my um grass to there a little bit i sort of resisted a little bit but this we've been forced into it because in studios obviously when you're with someone face to face it's always a lot easier um but i mean it goes, yeah it goes pretty well there's a bit of a delay but it went well so no we're good man yeah good stuff